In the previous video, I've described the parallel relative switch largely from the vantage point of the pentatonic scale. But now let's move into the diatonic world in order to discover, among other things, why I'm calling this system the parallel relative switch. The pentatonic scale served nicely as a quick thumbnail sketch up for us. However, if we observe all of this in a diatonic sense, we can take a much, much deeper dive. I call major or minor the quality of a chord or scale. We're taught in school the idea that major is happy and minor is sad, so much so that it's become a cliché. Other characteristics we can give these two chords is to say that um, minor is dark, brooding, somber, and serious, whereas major is sunny, hopeful, positive, and content. The fact that the blues blends major and minor qualities together is what makes it bittersweet. I consider the blending of major and minor in blues to be a form of musical alchemy. Blues lyrics often portray negative experiences that the artist went through. That's the bitter part of the blues, the minor key part. But in the act of singing out about our woes and mishaps, we find emotional release in the joy of playing music itself, giving us that major key feeling, the happy feeling. These blend together. I don't think it's just a coincidence that having a negative feeling and joyfully releasing it through music is similar to the idea of blending minor and major together. It's truly magical that this happens at all. Playing music is happiness itself, and the sheer joy of playing blues is redemptive for those who play it. Maybe that's why you can often see blues musicians smiling from ear to ear when they're performing. To get clear on why I've given this system its name, we have to go into the diatonic scales represented by the two intermingling keys we found when exploring this idea through pentatonic scales. Later on down the line, we'll look again at horizontal chord movement in more detail. There's still some really interesting patterns to explore there. But for now, we're going to start moving into vertical harmony, or how chords are built within this system. In order to build the decatonic blues model, we need to stay with the idea of chord movement for just a little bit longer, but it all begins here. And here's where you'll find my reason for calling the system the parallel relative switch. For this demonstration, we're going to change gear and work with the key of A major and its array of chords. And here it is with all of its triads placed in diatonic fashion. I don't include the seventh step diminished chord for good reason. Maybe later on I'll explain why, but suffice it to say that this helps us to look at things more clearly since we get a symmetrical set of three major chords and three minor chords. So here we have our chords of the key of A major. To go parallel, the first step of this two-step process, we first transform A major to A minor. This is the parallel part of the parallel relative switch. To go relative, we now place A minor as the sixth step of some key. This is the relative minor, and this is also the relative part of the parallel relative switch process, the final step in this two-step process. If a minor chord is at the sixth step of some major key, that key turns out to be C major. So we lay out the chords of that key as well. A major is now the umbrella key serving as the root. C major is the switched key, which resolves back to A major. We have now successfully achieved the very same conclusion that we did with our earlier pentatonic thinking. So there's a question here then. Why don't I just call it the parallel switch? In other words, since I have unpacked the key of C major from A major, and since it originally came from the A minor or the A natural minor scale to begin with, why bother to go relative and bring up the key of C at all? After all, there's no difference between the key of C major and A natural minor. They both contain the same chords. Well, first you've seen in the last video that the overriding chords in the examples used were major chords. And this is because this system is major or dominant seven blues based. In any case, I plan to prove my point about C major and not necessarily A minor when I talk about the sharp nine chord later on down the line. But this leads to another question then. 
Since blues is more than simply major bass, but in reality dominant seventh bass, shouldn't I begin not with the standard C major scale, but instead with the Mixolydian scale, where after all the dominant seventh sits? Trust me, this notion bothered me for a long, long time. But when I finally derived what I call the decatonic blues model, once again, as so many other questions, this too was finally cleared up. If you know your music theory, it'll become clear to you too. With that said, I want to point out that it's still quite valuable to compare the keys of A major and A natural minor in this system. Also, it may seem counterintuitive, but it's also possible to work the blues in a major seventh and not dominant seventh environment. Maybe I'll bring that up later, but for now, let's just stick with what we're doing, and many of these questions will be soon answered. Now that we clearly understand how we're getting our two keys, we can speak about vertical harmony or chord building. So here's the notes of A major and C major laid out. This is where things start to go deep. Now we're going to take the notes from the keys of A major and C major and blend them together. After all, we're talking about key blending here. So again, here we have the notes of A and C. You'll notice that there are plenty of redundant notes between those keys. A, B, D, and E are common to both keys, so we don't need to think about blending those notes from C major into A major because they're already there. So let's get rid of them. When we eliminate those redundant notes from the key of C, we're now left with the notes C, F, and G. Let's add those leftover notes from C major into A major. Here, we're left with a 10-note sequence that, for lack of a better term, I'm calling the decatonic blues model. In our previous pentatonic thinking, we pitted the minor pentatonic scale against a major root and extracted a second key from it. Here, I decided to merge these two keys together in a diatonic fashion. And here's where the fun begins. Now, can we find a one dominant seventh chord for an A blues? The answer is yes. I'm now pulling out the 5-7 chord from the decatonic model based on A7. Okay, great. Now, for the 1-4-5 dominant 7, we have our 1 dominant 7. Now we need the D7 chord. Let's see if that comes out of this model. Well, there it is. Now we have the D7 chord. Now, to complete our situation, we need the E7 chord to complete the 1, 4, and 5 dominant 7th chords in a standard 12-bar blues. Let's see if we get it. And there we have it. There's much, much more to this, but I think we've made a good start here. I need to add a disclaimer here. I don't consider this 10-note sequence to be an actual scale. When I rounded up this series of notes, it went against all I believe to be true about diatonic scales. The diatonic scale, after all, is a natural phenomenon whose discovery is attributed to Pythagoras. Pythagoras got the diatonic scale from nature herself by performing experiments with natural phenomena. The modern tweak scales, or artificially constructed scales, like the whole tone scale and the diminished scale, don't exist in nature, but I consider these to be diatonic because a valid triad can be constructed on each step of the scale. This is, to me, the ultimate criterion for what could be called a diatonic scale. That is, when a valid triad, either major, minor, diminished, or augmented, can be built on each step of the scale. But when scales are created with adjacent half steps, I find myself hard pressed to call it a valid diatonic scale. After all, where does it all end? Can you string any group of notes together on a whim and just because it's a string of notes, it's called a scale? If that's the case, then you could come up with a nearly infinite amount of scales. The buck has to stop somewhere. And with adjacent half steps, that's where it stops for me. You may recall earlier, too, that I said any so-called diatonic scale that has adjacent half steps is verboten in my books. Now look at the overwhelming array of half steps we have here. You can imagine my cognitive dissonance when I first saw this. With that said, 
This quasi scale is solving a lot of problems for me that I couldn't solve with a typical seven note diatonic scale. And it does it elegantly. The way this seeming scale solves the problem, for example, of the 1-4-5 dominant seventh chord in the blues, as well as other traditional licks, riffs, and harmonies, well, it pretty much blew my mind. To me, the ultimate test is whether or not this is logical. When we consider that the blues is the melding of major and minor qualities together, the idea of combining two keys makes eminently logical sense to me. As a result, I have to adapt to this situation, whether or not it agrees with my beliefs. But rather than thinking of it as a scale, I want to think of it more as a tonal model to work with. There are a few other issues with this model that may come up that I'm anticipating from viewers who know deep music theory. I'm well aware of what those issues are, and I can vindicate my theory from the expected arguments I might get. To my mind, this theory is way too elegant to be cynically tossed aside. At the bottom line, it just makes sense. What amazes me here is that nearly every day I get something new and interesting or even totally mind-blowing from this model. It keeps revealing so much to me that I consider it analogous to what a meditation student gets out of a yantra or a mandala. This model has for me become a mandala, which keeps giving me something new all the time, and all of which I'm sharing with you now, and I'll keep updating in future videos the more I find. And speaking of sharing, I'm going to show you in the next video what the decatonic model can validate. For example, with the 1 and 4 and 5 dominant 7th chords, the blue note relative to each chord is traditionally used. The blues turnaround connects to all of this as well. That turnaround isn't just a turnaround, but it's more a phrase that's traditionally used against the 1, the 4, and the 5 dominant 7th chords. Also, I will prove precisely where the sharp 9, the 4 minor, and the flat 7 dominant 7th chord come from. The parallel relative switch is intimately connected with the notion of negative harmony that's been floating around the internet in music theory circles these days. Eventually, I'm going to show you the connection. But what I'm also going to show you is how much more expansive the parallel relative switch is. For example, I've just explained to you the 1, 4, 5 dominant 7th chord showing up in a 12-bar blues. Negative harmony could never explain this. Uh, negative harmony does explain uh, the connection between the umbrella key and the um, switch key, but that's about the extent of it. Anyway, as we move on, I'm going to show you that and much, much more. Thanks so much for watching. Please spread the word about this. This is a game changer for all Western harmony, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this.